Hey guys, it's Liana and I'm here today to talk about rereading the first Law trilogy. I feel like I just showed you the back of the book there instead of like the trilogy, but y'all know what I'm talking about. So if you've never seen my channel before, then you may not know that I'm a huge fan of Joe Abercrombie and the first Law. Mainly the first Law. I did read the first book in the Shattered Sea trilogy and I was not a fan. It wasn't awful, but it was kind of a big letdown. I have heard that the other books in that series take place like follow different characters and are better. So I intend to read the others because like still I have a Abercrombie. So of course I'll give him another chance. I have a whole shelf that's like crumbling under the weight of all my Abercrombie books and I have more Abercrombie books on the way because I have his newest book pre-ordered in multiple editions. So um, I'm rereading these books. Why am I rereading them? Um, one, because I'm kind of rereading all of the first law books in anticipation of the next one coming out. Not that I need to because it hasn't been that long since I read them, but just because I feel like it. And two, yeah, because I feel like it because we live in crazy times. <laughs> And I'm, I'm not here to talk about politics. I'm not here to talk about any of that. But I think regardless of how you specifically feel or where you fall in the political like spectrum of opinion, I think you'd agree we live in crazy times, like very polarizing times. And Joe Abercrombie's cynicism, it just hits the spot so much that I'm in the mood for that a lot. And um, it's weirdly uplifting to me because when I watch the news or I see things that are like upsetting to me, again, just like world news, domestic news, whatever it is, political news, social news, all this stuff, that it just, it, it takes a toll. And when I read more hopeful and fantastical things where it's just like, well, yo, why don't we just have a hero with a sword that just like fixes it? I'd be like, yeah, like, why can't we do that? Why is our world such shit? Where is our Luke Skywalker to fix it? When I read Abercrombie books, it's really uplifting to me that their world is equally shit. They've got wizards and stuff, but it turns out that corrupt politicians still fuck up the world all the goddamn time and that your heroes are probably not that heroic. So like honestly having a hero would solve nothing. And Galacta's cynicism and internal monologue of just like having it to hear with everybody is just, I'm just like preach, preach motherfucker. I am here for this. So that's why I'm rereading them. And how did I feel rereading them? So like I originally, when I first read The Blade itself years and years and years ago, uh, I was still reading like the very hopeful, heroic, escapist type fantasy and I had no idea that the blade itself was not that way. Because the cover is just like, you know, like, yeah, there's some blood splatter on it, but like it just, it looks like a fantasy book. There's nothing that proclaims it to be that grimdark. And I had never really tried it. I didn't even know what grimdark was. I was very young. <laughs> so when I read the blade itself then, I was just like, why is everyone and everything awful? Why would I want to read this? So I read it and I was just like, uh, okay. <laughs> And then years went by and just like I kept seeing those books come up as people's just like all time favorites. And I was like, since then I had been reading more and darker things. And I was like, I remember not loving that, but also I was like a kid. <laughs> so I should probably give it a, give it another go slash they had released the Golan's anniversary editions. And I was like, I want it real bad. It's such a pretty book. And I was like, but I, I remember not really loving it. So like I have to reread it and, and see because Maybe I'll love it <laughs> and then I can get that edition. And I fucking love it. Oh my God, I'm so glad I reread it. I mean, it really goes to show that who you are as a reader does change and that you should be aware of that. So the same thing happened with Vicious, honestly. So it's, there's been a couple like that. The second time that I read The Blade itself, I was just like, oh, this is actually like super my jam now. Like I am so here for this. And now the third time reading The Blade itself, this time I wasn't reading it to be like, let's see if I like it this time and being like, oh wow, no, I super like this now. I already knew that I liked it. So reading it now was just like, give me that Glockta. Yup, mainline me that Glockta. And it was also because it was fresh. I mean, the second, the first time that I had reread it, it had been a long time since I read it. All I remembered was not very much liking it, but I didn't really remember specifics about the world or the characters or any of that. So the first time that I reread it, it was like reading it anew because I hardly remembered anything other than my opinion of it. So now rereading it much more closely to my previous read of it, I was already pretty much aware of, it was fresh in my brain, the, the, the plot points, the story beats. So I wasn't sitting there going like, oh, what's gonna happen next? I know what's gonna happen next. And the this trilogy itself isn't very like plot driven. It isn't the kind of book where you're just like, what's going to happen next? It's more like, what are these characters gonna do? What are they gonna say? Because of that, then I just could sort of sit back and casually 
just savor the moments that I knew were coming and savor the character interactions that I knew were coming. And also look forward to seeing some some groundwork that I that would have flown by me the first time through. You don't know that that moment's coming, that you don't know that connection is coming, you don't know that reveal is coming. So there's some reveals that don't happen honestly until the end of the third book, but those groundwork and the seeds for that reveal are peppered throughout this this trilogy. So you have no idea to look to look for it when you're first reading it. This is my first time reading it through knowing those things already. So I could pick up the blade itself and before they were hanged and the last argument of kings, knowing what I know now and look for those moments where those things have begun to show themselves, where the first seeds of those reveals are being planted that you don't know that's happening the first time. Because like I do one of the most frequent criticisms of I most frequent criticisms that I've seen of the trilogy beyond this is too depressing and dark why would you read this uh, I've seen people complain that it seems to be meandering and you did doesn't seem to be going anywhere in particular like nothing seems to pay off it's going nowhere all the time and John Abercrombie does kind of intentionally make it that way because he's basically he said himself that it's kind of his dark twisted take on the classic fantasy uh trilogy arc where you have the wizard and the hero and the whatever all just kind of like flipped on its head in the grimdark version of that so Instead of having the moments be significant, they are the opposite of that. Instead of a prophecy turning out to be epic, it turns out to be shit. <laughs> like Everything is just kind of like the bizarro world version of the heroic fantasy. So it's kind of intentional. It seems everything does seem kind of like cynically pointless and very like jaded and nihilistic because that's kind of the point of the trilogy. But also there is a point to things like at the end of the third one, you do find out like that there is kind of a lot of things that seemed pointless. They are pointless, but for a reason. <laughs> like it was not just intended by Joe Abercrombie, but intended by the characters who are making these things happen. They they knew it was pointless when they set out to do it. So like the cynic, the, basically the, the big reveal being so cynical at the end. And then again, watching there are there are seeds for that planted. There are connections to that throughout the book. So it's not like it was this last minute, like, well, I guess everything means nothing at the end. Like, you know, looking at you, Star Wars. <laughs> like, it was clearly his intention, because if you read The Blade itself after having read the trilogy, you can see, like, it is all building towards that ending. He knew where this was going when he started writing it. And I just, I loved seeing it happen now knowing it, because it, even the first time I read it, even though I was loving the journey, the journey did feel meandering. The journey did feel like it was kind of going nowhere. I was like, I'm still here for this because I fucking love these characters. And like, I love... I'm just loving, I'm eating this up, but also like, where is any of this going? <laughs> so now I do know where it's going. So now I'm not sitting there going like, where is this going? I know where it's going. So I'm just like, hey, little do you know that this is all going to be, you know, whatever. Glockta is my spirit animal and my soulmate. Fucking love Sandan Glockta. Uh, there's like, I, he's probably my favorite character in literature to date. I've never read a character like Sandan Glockta. He's, oh, I fucking love him. He's so awful. <laughs> But I also love Logan Ninefingers, uh, Giselle Dan Luther, you know, he grows on you. Like the character work, Abercrombie continues to be the best author at doing character work that I have ever seen. I, I continue to be gobsmacked by it. Even the characters that aren't my favorites, like Glockta is, he's always painting the most intricate, messy portrait of humanity that I've ever seen any author do. So just chef's kiss. It's just a joy to watch him do it. And especially rereading re it, I'm not trying to follow the plot so much because I know what's going to happen so I can just sit back and watch the parts that I'm fascinated by, i.e. watching him plant seeds for the reveal, watching him build up these character arcs, watching him mess with your expectations. Like, I can just watch it unfold and just be like, oh man, you're so good. You're so fucking good at this. Like, oh, look at you. Oh, look at the way you're like, oh yeah, like, that's so brilliant. I see you, sir. I see you and I'm here for you. Um, in conclusion, actually, I gave The Blade itself five stars on my reread. First time through, so it's, I think it's been, I've added a star every time I read it. I think I gave it three stars. I don't even think I was rating books back when I first read it because I wasn't using Goodreads or anything. But if I had rated it, I probably would have given it three stars because I'd have been like, it seems pretty well cobbled together, but like, why the fuck would I want to read this? Rereading re it, I was like, oh man, that was actually really good. Like, I'm super here for that. But also like, it's kind of going nowhere. So like, like, I don't know what the point of any of that was, even though I super enjoyed it. So I gave it four stars the first time that I reread it. And now that I reread it, I gave it five stars. because so I was just like, you know what, man? This book though, like, it's so fucking good. Like, give it, give it the five, give it the five. So it went from being two fours and a five to being a five, a four and a five. Maybe the third time that I read before they're hanged, it'll bump it up to a five. We'll see, I'm sure I will reread it, let's be real. So let me know in the comments down below if you've read Abercrombie. If you have not, um, I obviously recommend. Uh, let me know in the comments down below. Anything else you wanna let me know about your favorite trilogies, about 
why you hated Abercrombie and you don't understand why the fuck I like it, sure, let me know that. <laughs> I post bookish videos on Saturdays, so like and subscribe, and I'll see you when I see you. Bye.